So you found the perfect speakers for your system. Congratulations. Now you need to power them. You want an amplifier that matches well with the speakers you purchased, right? In this video, I'll be going over the different things you must consider when shopping for a new amp and how to narrow down the right one for you. Stay tuned. Hello everyone, I'm Mike, your hi-fi journalist. I want to thank you for stopping by and checking out the video. If you enjoy the content and feel like you've gotten something from it, I humbly ask you that you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell to get notified every time I put out new content, which is usually between one and three times a week. <laughs> Before we get started, if you'd like to support the channel, I have an online t-shirt shop where I sell hi-fi audio inspired clothing. Uh, check out the description below and your purchases go straight back into the channel and help me make more videos. So win-win, win-win. On to the task at hand, guys. I think this is a subject that many, I'd say many people have just glazed over instead of explaining things to where someone who has no clue how the amplifier and speaker matching process works can understand and make a proper purchasing decision. Uh, many also think it's all about watts and power. Yes, it's a factor that I'll cover and that you should consider, but there are a couple of other things that we are going to be covering here today that will get you where you need to be. So let's go ahead and get started. The first step is to check your new speaker's specifications. The manufacturer will write out a little section on their website in words and acronyms you may not understand, but it will look something like this. So what do you do with this? At least for me, it looked like hieroglyphics the first time I encountered this little box of science and math. However, this little box will be absolutely essential when trying to find an amplifier for those holy grail speakers you just bought. So we will begin by discussing the speaker's efficiency or sometimes referred to sensitivity which is measured in decibels or DB if you're reading the spec sheet. Companies measure the efficiency of a loudspeaker by placing a microphone one meter from the speaker and then providing the speaker with one watt of power. So if you stand one meter from your speaker and input one watt of power from your amplifier, which results in, let's say, 86 decibels of sound, then the speaker sensitivity is 86 decibels. Doubling the wattage input into your speaker will result in approximately three decibels of volume increase. In this case, two watts of power will result in 89 decibels, four watts of power will produce 92 decibels, and so on and so forth. At 10 watts of power, you would be delivering about 97 decibels of volume. That's literally about as loud as a Boeing 737 one nautical mile away before landing. Crazy. Always consider that you will lose approximately six decibels of sound every time you double the distance between yourself and the speaker. Usually speakers range in efficiency from, you know, about 85 decibels, which is considered very inefficient, to 105 decibels, which is very efficient when measured in decibels. For example, a loudspeaker that measures 90.5 decibels, like the KLH Model 5s, doesn't necessarily need a powerful amplifier to fill your room with sound since with around 20 watts of power you'll be able to play them at a reasonable listening volume. This is a big misconception with amplifiers and companies that tout all these enormous amounts of watts per channel. It is simply the fact that you will more than likely never listen to or use even half the watts they're rated at. You would probably blow your speakers or your eardrums before reaching that high of wattage. So. Let's say you bought a speaker with horrible efficiency. Don't worry, this isn't a bad thing per se. You'll have to find an amplifier that can give the speaker the proper power to drive them to their full potential. It may be a bit more money or time and effort to find one, but they are available. Most speaker manufacturers are making their speakers with decent efficiency since most stay within the high 80s to low 90s in decibel range. So you'll be okay.
Many audiophiles prefer the sound of tube amplifiers because they have a bit of distortion that causes the feeling of warmth to come across its sonic signature. Most of these low wattage amps, like let's say Nelson Pass's first watt SIT3, SIT3 only provides 18 watts per channel. However, paired with really efficient speakers, this amplifier can provide a beautiful sound that isn't easily matched by many amplifiers in the industry. At the same time, if you pair the same amplifier with very inefficient speakers, it may not play as well as expected because of its limitation in pumping copious amounts of watts and volts into a pair of power-hungry loudspeakers. So you gotta match them right. Let's say you're using Vincent Audio's SP332 power amplifier, which can provide up to 150 watts of power per channel at 8 ohms. I think it is safe to say this hybrid amplifier, which utilizes both solid state and tube amplification topology, can drive most speakers you would throw its way. Watts and power are very matter of fact and rely on knowing the speaker's efficiency. What are ohms? I mentioned ohms earlier because the impedance of a loudspeaker is also something you need to consider when pairing your speakers with an amplifier. A speaker's impedance, sometimes referred to as uh, sensitivity, is measured in ohms, which relates directly to a circuit's opposition to the flow of electrical current. This is another moment where you must look at the speaker's specifications and find the speaker's nominal impedance. The resistance is called nominal impedance for speakers as the actual impedance changes based on the frequencies of sound you are playing at the time. Usually loudspeakers will have a nominal impedance of either 8, 6, or 4 ohms. The most important thing to remember is the lower the ohms, the more current is coming through. If you have a speaker output labeled minimum of four ohms, you can connect one four ohm speaker or two eight ohm speakers to that output. If you were to connect two four ohm speakers to that output, it would overload the amplifier and probably destroy it. So making sure your amplifier can handle the ohms listed on your speaker specs is also a critical factor to consider when deciding on an amplifier. How many speakers will you be connecting to your new amplifier? Something you will already know beforehand, obviously, uh, depending on whether you'll be setting up a home theater or just a simple two-channel listening environment. Most basic home theaters will run five speakers and a subwoofer to help recreate a theater-like environment and provide a full range experience. In this case, you will need to buy an audio video receiver or called an AVR. An AVR has many functions and features that will consolidate your entertainment needs into one device. For example, if you have a TV, flat screen TV, media streamer, Blu-ray player, gaming machine, uh, most new AVRs will allow you to connect them via HDMI cable into your AVR. The receiver will then process the sound and picture, sending the video signal to your flat screen or projector, and then the audio signal to its internal amplifier, which will power all five speakers. Five speakers are modest for some home theater enthusiasts or fanatics, let's say. The advent of Dolby Atmos and full surround sound has driven the cinephiles of the world into a feeding frenzy to fit more and more and more and more speakers into their environment. However, five speakers are an excellent place to start and you can always move up from there. The AVR will be your media hub and amplifier for all audio video needs. Suppose you are just running, I don't know, two speakers primarily for music. In that case, you'll need a two-channel amplifier with enough power uh, and match the nominal impedance to allow your speakers to play at their you know, finest capacity. Talk about class warfare, guys. As if this was not confusing enough for someone starting out, the next step would be to decide what class of amplifier you want to use in your system. There are several classes of amplifiers. However, the most typical are class A, class A, B, and D. Class A amplifiers are found more in the realm of high-end home audio. The part of the amplifier responsible for converting the input voltage into output power is always on, 
making these amplifiers relatively inefficient because whatever voltage they do not use turns into heat. It's kind of like a little space heater with these Class A amps. It's constantly consuming energy. It is also the heaviest and most expensive amplifier out of the group. Why is this so sought after then by all the audiophiles if you know, it's such an inconvenience? Well, because the sound they produce is considered to be probably the best quality amongst all classes of amplifiers. If you've never heard a proper class A amplifier, I think you should head over to a, like either a hi-fi shop or a buddy's house who actually has one set up because they sound really, really nice. A class AB amplifier is a bit different where it is not always off, but it's not always on. It is a compromise without sacrificing too much of the sound quality of a class A amplifier with better efficiency and lessening the price compared to its class A counterpart. I actually did a poll on my community page here on YouTube and 56% at the time, 56% preferred class AB because of its balance of value and sound quality. Class D amplifiers are becoming a more popular and widely used type of amplifier among the lower priced offerings. Even actually higher end brands are starting to adopt Class D since its quality has evolved quickly over the years. They are highly efficient, can be made to be much smaller and lighter, produce less heat, and are the least expensive. A huge misconception is that Class D stands for digital, which it does not. It is just another designation for the amplifier class. Over the years, they have evolved into a fantastic sounding option for your sound system. And I imagine we will see a lot of more of these in the coming years in more high-end applications. So choosing your amplifier is an important decision because in my experience, they do have different sonic signatures even within the same power ratings and classes. A company's engineering team will do their very best to ensure a pleasant sonic experience. Uh, nonetheless, not all amplifiers are made the same or designed the same way. This creates, you know, slight distinctions in the sound they produce. Some are warm and pleasant, others are, can come across as cold or shrill. It's always best to do your due diligence when making your final decision. This can be a purchase that you know, may very well last you decades, as many amplifiers from the 1970s and 80s are actually still circulating in the used market today and work fantastic. Plan for this purchase to be an excellent match for your current speakers, but also future-proof yourself by purchasing an amplifier that can match well with speakers you will likely upgrade to. So kind of find your groove and work from there. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining me today. I know this was kind of a long one, but if you learned something new, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell to get notified when I release my next video. If you have more questions or want to talk more about amplifiers, definitely ask in the comment section below or head on over to my exclusive Facebook group called the Hi-Fi Community or visit my website www.audioarchitects.com and ask the questions in our online forum. Lots of ways to connect, guys. So there's, if you want to talk amps, let's do it. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.